Hit the subscribe button or visit us at auau.auanet.org. Okay, if we could go ahead and get the um, QR code slide up, because I think that's the one where they have the opportunity to respond. So we'll get that up. I'll read a little housekeeping. Hi, I'm Mike Cookson, and uh, welcome to our uh, guidelines-based uh, advanced prostate cancer um, course. We understand that you know, probably there's a happy hour out there somewhere for you, so we'll do our best to make you happy and get ready to go. Um, there, there's some audience response questions that are reliant on that QR code. So if you take a picture of it on your camera, then there'll be five questions that we'll ask. And that's kind of the front end, and then we'll get on with the course. Uh, there are uh, people um, streaming in live, so uh, they see the slides and they hear what we say in the microphone. So if you have a question, we'll encourage you to use the microphone so that they will be able to you know, participate in that. Um, everyone knows to silence their cell phones and you know, do good behavior during the course, so I'm sure about that you have that. Of course, all our disclosures are listed on the website, so that's important for you guys to know too. So with that, <clears throat> if everybody's taken a picture of that QR code, and by the way, the um, AUA has I think a hard copy of it too, so you can take a picture that way as well if you didn't get it off your phone. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Our first um, ARS question is, in patients with newly diagnosed prostate cancer, genetic counseling and genetic testing should be discussed in the setting of A, small cell, B, ductal carcinoma, C, grade group two, and D, atypia and the absence of basal cells. So if you're just coming in, I think there's a QR code out there if they didn't give it to you, so you can do the questions. And so as you guys enter in some answers, I think we get a little indicator of that. I think you have to advance it. To get the yeah, yeah we're not I, was, I wasn't sure if we needed to do anything on the QR code, we but... Go. Now we're talking. All right. In Chicago, you can vote multiple times. <laughs> For those of you just getting here, there's a little QR code you can put in your phone. You can answer questions. And I think that the um, AUA staff has a, a way for you to do that, even if you didn't get in on the picture taken part. We have. Has everyone had time to vote who wants to vote? Because I don't really know how many of you are going to do it. So we have to kind of move on once we think all the votes are cast. OK. Uh, next pretest question in BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutated genes are identified in a patient with metastatic prostate cancer. They are there are they are at risk for other cancers such as colon and pancreatic. They will be insensitive to ADT. C DNA damage repair pathways are likely to be normal, and D are more likely to have low risk prostate cancer. <coughs> Our third question, doublet combination therapy has been demonstrated to show survival benefit in metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer with ADT in each of the following except, so you're trying to identify the one that's not true, A, enzalutamide, B, abiraterone, C, apalutamide, and D, darolutamide. We're talking about doublet combination therapy. Okay. 
treatment intensification or triple therapy in metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer has been most proven in patients who present with A, de novo, synchronous disease, B, high volume, charted definition disease, C, high risk latitude disease, D, BRCA2 mutations, and E, non-visceral metastases. voter fatigue already. Okay, question five. A 67-year-old man with moderately symptomatic metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer, including visceral metastases. He's on continuous ADT. He was previously treated with docetaxel and enzalutamide. Germline and somatic testing are negative, and so the next best treatment for him is... A, cipulusal T, B, abiraterone, C, rucaparib, D, cabazitaxel. Again, if you're just getting here, you can do the um, QR code that they hand, the AOA staff has, and then you can do the questions at your leisure. Okay, I think we'll go ahead and bring up the uh, first slide deck, Cookson slide deck. As we get started here, I want to thank you all for coming. I know it's late in the afternoon. Many of you have been to many things all day. Sometimes the time slots just are what they are, and you don't always get your perfect pole position. Um, we are excited to present to you the 2023 AUA guidelines and beyond, because we don't just stick prescriptively to the guidelines. Um, we have um, our usual suspect cast of really outstanding uh, leaders in the field. We have uh, David Gerard from the University of Wisconsin, Adam Keibel from Brigham and Women's, and Dana Farber, and uh, I'm sorry, uh, not Kirsten Scarpato, but Will Lawrence. so uh, sorry about that, Will, and uh, Will is uh, chair of the AUA Guidelines Committee. Guess I won't be back on it. Um, the uh, disease states that we will be covering um, are, are pretty incorporated. So I'm going to start out with a little bit of background on just advanced prostate cancer in general um, and, and metastatic disease. And then um, uh, Dr. Lawrence is going to cover uh, the additional guidelines, um, including the castration resistant M0 and M1 disease. So uh, this year, when they gave the prostate cancer statistics out, um, you know, not surprisingly, prostate cancer remains the most common uh, non-skin cancer and the most common solid tumor in men, 288,000 plus cases um, in the United States and represents about 29%. Um, higher incidence in blacks than whites. Um, but what we are seeing now, and this is starting to come in consistently, is um, an increase in the number of newly diagnosed advanced and metastatic patients. Um, this is probably more than just an absence of screening. There's some other factors at play that have yet to be defined. But because this increasing number of advanced um, disease at presentation or de novo, that is concerning and all the more reason to familiarize ourselves with the treatment options for these men um, because currently metastatic prostate cancer is not curable or and with rare exception. And so all the uh, treatments we're doing are trying to improve their survival as well as the quality of their life as we go forward. There um, has been well known uh, that androgen responsiveness to prostate cancer um, has been present since the Nobel Prize winning work of uh, Charles Huggins. Um, the androgen receptor is highly expressed in prostate cancer, directly stimulates its growth and survival, and depriving prostate cancer cells is and remains kind of the primary um, focus of our, our frontline therapy for metastatic disease. 
Fortunately, 90% um, plus of these tumors initially respond to androgen deprivation therapy. However, um, we know that that therapy does not cure them. Patients will ultimately progress through that into the state of resistance, and then it can become lethal. The extent of patient's disease has been known about in terms of how they respond to treatment for a long time, really. Uh, David Crawford in 1989 mentioned it, first report of it, and the disease extent. And they, at that time, noted minimal disease was really confined to either lymph nodes, the spine, or the pelvis. Uh, some of the SWOG studies looking at, in the old days, combinations of flutamide with or without, uh, orchiectomy with or without flutamide also looked at subsetting patients based on visceral or bony metastases. And then uh, the charted definition, which you'll hear a lot about, is um, for low and high volume patients that have high volume disease have either visceral disease, four or more bony mets with at least one outside of the vertebral column or pelvis. So those will come into play as we um, interpret some of the data, including some of the newer data. Um, we know that PSA is a surrogate for response to therapy, and some of the trial data suggests that a PSA that falls to less than four after about six to seven months of therapy is associated with a better overall prognosis. Um, there are other parameters that we use today as well, and not just falling less than four, but the lower it goes, uh, the better um, patients seem to be responding to the therapy. The guidelines that we're going to refer to today are AUA guidelines, but we have partners. So we've had over the years partners like um, ASCO, ASTRO, and certainly the SUO. I think the latest iteration um, is in uh, ASCO and SUO. I think the ASTRO uh, did not uh, follow on this one just because there really wasn't a lot of radiation therapy on it. Um, but these guidelines continue to sort of cull through the literature and you know look to the most pertinent um, new articles and high-level evidence and then try to synthesize that and present it to you and they, they we're not here to talk about localized prostate cancer or truly just early um, uh, failure patients but patients who have relapse after failed local therapy uh, metastatic disease non-metastatic CRPC and CRPC so those are really kind of the what we're going to cover today. Biochemical recurrence uh, without metastatic disease, um, this is in patients who are untreated but have had local treatments but not hormonal manipulations. And PSA recurrence almost always precedes uh, metastases and failure. So patients are followed with serial PSAs and clinical evaluations and now staging, which of course will include PET scanning, as you'll see. Um, PSMA PET has now moved up as the preferential imaging treatment for patients with um, biochemical recurrence, whether that's radiation or surgery that they've failed. Um, and where available, that's recommended. We know that all patients can access that. And of course, there is still a role for conventional imaging, but we know that it's limited in terms of its abilities, especially in the very uh, low ranges. So um, patients that are at high risk particularly should undergo PSMA PET scanning. Um, the guideline recommendation for PSMA PET was based on several studies that have now come forward. Originally, these um, studies were looking at um, detection in men with biochemical recurrence, and then they moved on to high-risk staging up front. Um, and two agents are currently FDA available, the Gallium uh, 68 as well as the uh, Polarify um, F18. So, there are some differences in um, how they're produced and availability based on where you live in the world, but um, the approval of these drugs then subsequently led to um, the ability for us to recommend them and incorporate them in, into the guidelines. Again, uh, I, I won't go over every nuance of the study, but we are all very aware that PSA detection now is possible even in patients with PSA ranges of uh, some less than 0.5, but certainly in that very low level detection area. And the performance, of course, helps to predict whether it's nodal recurrence or 
um, outside the pelvis, including bone. So these are some of the data from their original study. Um, the, the Condor study, um, as well as the Osprey study, were the two main studies that really um, got their ball rolling. And in the Condor study, they were looking at patients with PSA elevations after uh, local treatment and found um, the detection level to be quite sensitive and, 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 and outperforming of traditional. And then the Osprey study not only took patients with biochemical recurrence, but also had a cohort of patients that had um, high cohort A was the high risk patients who were um, undergoing or uh, contemplating undergoing surgery. And so that also led to ability to approve um, the use of, uh, of these PSMA PET scans in the setting of newly diagnosed high-risk patients, including some with um, unfavorable intermediate risk, as well as the biochemical recurrent patients and certainly uh, used in metastases. Um, so we'll move on now to some of the guideline information for uh, the 2023 update, looking at um, what is available for patients with biochemical recurrence. Um, we can't make these things happen fast enough. As you probably know, there's been studies uh, presented earlier this morning where the data wasn't available even in the abstract. So uh, we'll talk about that probably in the discussion. But in the past, um, up until you know, we, we have um, Embark study data to synthesize and place into our um, guideline uh, machinery and then come out with it, really it was felt that like for patients with lower risk and slow doubling times, they could easily be observed um, and enroll in clinical trials such as Embark. However, um, in patients who either have higher risk features, rapid doubling times, those who feel that you know, watching their PSA alone is unacceptable. Um, intermittent hormonal therapy uh, has been uh, suggested for these patients. This is based on a intergroup study, a SWOG study that um, compared continuous to intermittent therapy in patients that had failed radiation therapy. And in a statistical jargon, it was a non-inferiority type study, but basically the patients did as well when they were on intermittent therapy using traditional ADT. So uh, again, next year when we come back, we'll have a couple of additions to this, but it'll include, I'm sure, the Embark data, which was used in high-risk patients, those with rapid doubling times, and uh, used combination of novel hormonal therapy with ADT and showed metastasis-free survival benefit. But um, we can't make the course go any faster, and these slides get turned in early, so here we are. Um, the presence and extent of metastatic patients, now we're going to kind of focus on newly um, presenting uh, that de novo patient or even a progressive patient who has failed uh, se several local therapies. But newly diagnosed metastatic patients um, should undergo um, radiographic assessment. Um, I've already mentioned that the PSMA PETs replace the conventional imaging for um, the preferred type, assessment of their symptoms, um, baseline uh, PSA, and probably testosterone levels. Genetic uh, counseling, there's multiple opportunities for uh, us to introduce uh, germline testing for men with advanced prostate cancer. Uh, this is certainly one of them. It requires some counseling as well. Um, so the extent of the disease should be evaluated. Um, and then in addition to evaluating the extent of their disease, usually we, we try to determine high volume, low volume in, in terms of uh, treatment algorithms for these patients as well. Um, the uh, baseline levels of their uh, PSA I've already mentioned. The, there's a variety of tests out there to do germline testing. Some of that does include um, a little bit of counseling up front. And most of you are aware, but there's uh, laws in the United States, the GINA law, that protects against certain aspects of genetic testing, but not all aspects of it. So for example, if they're determined to have it, there's a 50% chance that they could have passed it on to a family relative, a child, girl or boy. If they are determined to get tested, they may not be able to obtain like life insurance. They may not be able to get disability. So um, there's some things to do up front to kind of let them be aware of that. And the cascade effect on their family members is also important. The other area where genetic counseling can be important is in these variants. So, we, we were looking for certain things here, right? We're looking for BRCA1, BRCA2, maybe ATM. Uh, but 
there could be a variant of unknown significance, and then that's where the counselors um, certainly, hopefully, will do a much better job than we will in the future if something um, becomes evident that that variant now has a, a link to a serious medical condition, they'll be contacted about it. So um, in general, the patients with newly diagnosed metastatic disease should undergo um, hormonal therapy with ADT as a backbone, but no longer should it just be monotherapy. Um, it should be combinations of therapy, and that combination can either be kind of doublet therapy or it can be triplet therapy, and we'll, we'll kind of talk about that in a little bit. But even though the AUA guidelines still allow for ADT and docetaxel, for example, the NCCN is kind of recommending against that that combination because they think you should add something to it now that there's additional data out there. We're not taking that stance because there is value in that. And I don't know if any of you were at the early plenary on Friday morning, but we showed some report cards of the poor utilization of combination therapy, both in urology and oncology, up until currently. So just adding combination therapy improves survival, and we'll show the data on that, and that is a move forward for the field and for our patients. Um, the original study that got combination therapy going was the charted study. So we had previously used docetaxel, but only in castration-resistant state where there was like a three-month advantage. Then it got moved up into the metastatic, newly uh, appearing patients, and compared it to ADT. And what they found was there was a significant overall survival advantage, but not three months anymore. Now the survival advantage was going to be more like a year. And for patients that had that definition that I referred to earlier for truly high risk disease, the benefit was like 18 months. So that was a big move forward, and that started the combination therapy rolling, but that was seen both in a charted study and a European study called Stampede, where you pretty much have mirror image results of survival benefit by adding uh, the chemotherapy to the mix. So interestingly, in their study, they really didn't parse out the low-risk, high-risk patients. Um, and people have speculated it's because they had a lot more de novo presentation as a pair compared to the United States where we have a lot of patients that were progressing through treatments and that biology may be different. But um, pooling together in a meta-analysis, you can see that the addition of docetaxel to ADT alone was a significant improvement and became a new standard of care at the time. And we'll kind of leave it at that till we come back to the triple therapy. The use of abiraterone also in metastatic patients in combination with ADT was tested in a couple of different trials, um, and both showed similar results. So one was called Latitude, and Latitude just simply added abiraterone plus prednisone to the traditional ADT and compared it to ADT alone. And again, there was a significant survival advantage. The second study was Stampede, same trial design, same overall benefit, and these were like you know, something like 40% overall survival improvements over ADT alone. So we had docetaxel, we have abiraterone. Now here's apalutamide. So this is called the Titan study. Again, a novel hormonal therapy. And by the way, um, a little bit later on, we'll, Dr. Jard has um, a lot more detail on mechanisms of action and, and side effects. So you don't have to worry about getting that detail because it's included in the syllabus too. But adding um, a novel hormonal therapy like apalutamide in the Titan study, again, showed survival benefit over ADT alone. And then there was another study that looked at enzalutamide. This was the ARCHES study. And so again, adding that oral medication, novel hormonal therapy to ADT compared to ADT alone significantly improved the outcome and the first outcome measure was radiographic progression-free survival, and then they subsequently have an OS as well. And then the Enzymet study, which was another study looking at enzalutamide, um, was uh, again a survival benefit for these patients. So combination therapy with two drugs um, we've shown as benefit, and then uh, now the triplet therapy is here, and so there have been two studies that have been reported. This one's called PEACE-1, and basically they add 
Um, they, the, the standard of care at the time was we just mentioned was uh, the ADT plus docetaxel, so that was arm one, and then ADT docetaxel plus abiraterone was the comparator. And what they found was significant both radiographic progression-free and overall survival for patients treated with that uh, triple combination therapy. So that's why, like the NCCN says, okay, why, why would you just give them docetaxel? Now you should add something to the mix. Um, there was benefit. Most of these patients were high volume and high risk. I believe um, all of them were de novo. And so de novo was evident throughout this. There is um, some additional uh, side effects or adverse events that can occur, um, hypertension and certainly some liver uh, uh, abnormalities, so you need to follow them with blood work as you would for patients on abiraterone, and it of course is taken with, uh, uh, with prednisone. So the second triple therapy study that's out there is again comparing docetaxel and ADT, which was the standard, to docetaxel ADT plus, and this time they used the oral hormonal therapy darolutamide. And again, it was randomized, and it was powered for overall survival. And lo and behold, there was significant um, overall benefit to that combination of triple therapy. Um, it was well tolerated, and uh, the safety profile really um, was very similar to what you'd expect for most of the side effects came from the docetaxel side of the equator, so in the ADT alone. So there really wasn't a lot of additive side effects there. So when you look at the different types of treatment now available for patients with newly diagnosed metastatic disease, you can see that it's just no longer a Lupron shot, for example, or ADT alone. But again, when we do, they, they go back in real world and they do snapshots of what are these patients actually getting, they're finding still very low rates of use of chemotherapy, use of these novel hormonal therapies, less than 25% in one of the studies that was up till about 2021. So I think we're starting to improve and the hope is that um, as everyone gets more comfortable with this and understands the, the actual benefit, that we will be more embracing of, of these combination therapies, which are really the standard now. So the benefit of triple therapy is listed here. It's a, definitely an overall survival benefit. Um, there's debate, like should every patient get triple therapy or should some just get double it? And even the medical oncologists don't all agree on it, and that was kind of pointed out in our plenary, but for patients who have good performance status, young, certainly de novo, metastatic, those patients should be considered for triple therapy. Um, if they don't want to receive chemotherapy, then of course they can opt for um, the oral combination, so that, that's certainly an option for them. Uh, some have suggested you could do like maybe a more selected um, therapy where you could start them out on docetaxel with ADT and then if they're not responding well then add the oral agent but then again that's just really um, theory and, and not the way the studies were designed. So probably a more realistic algorithm for your patients would be newly diagnosed metastatic disease if they are um, sort of chemo averse or they don't want to do chemo, then you certainly can offer them the novel hormonal agents such as abiraterone or apalutamide or enzalutamide. And if they are candidates for chemo and willing to undergo it, then they have the choice of either abiraterone and darolutamide in combination with those two. What about local therapy? So the, the definitive local uh, treatment of choice is radiation therapy for men with newly diagnosed metastatic disease. Um, there were a couple of studies that looked at this. Um, they took all comers, so they weren't like geared for just low risk patients, but they were set up to stratify for it. Um, I'll go through this a little bit quick in the interest of time, but basically the overall they found that there was progression free survival for the whole group, but there wasn't overall survival benefit for the whole group. Um, when they subsetted it, though, for patients who had um, lower volume disease, and that's what this shows here, there was benefit. And so um, the, the take-home message here is that 
if you have uh, metastatic disease and it's low volume, based on the charted definition, there is um, overall survival benefit to adding radiation to the pelvis and the primary tumor. And, and so there's level one evidence for that and that got incorporated into the guidelines. Um, so there's the guideline statement for that. Uh, if you're thinking, well, surgery is better than radiation, or maybe they're equivalent, should I operate and remove the prostate? And that data is not there yet. So there's retrospective data. There's trials underway. The largest in the United States is this one, SWOG 1802, and it randomizes patients to local treatment or no local treatment plus the standard of care systemic therapy. And if they get randomized to the local treatment, there is um, opportunity for surgery or radiation, but that's in the context of a trial. So again, radiation for low volume patients is recommended, but uh, beyond that, no role for surgery and certainly would be used um, judiciously in high volume patients. So these are some other guideline statements that are in there, but I don't think many of you use just like, for example, the first generation anti-androgen bicalutamide as, as sort of your second uh, uh, oral agent in these patients. It's really just used for um, avoidance of the flare. And then uh, currently we don't use the novel hormonal therapy as monotherapy. It's used in combination with traditional. So take home messages for metastatic disease or chemo hormonal therapy um, is a standard of care, improves overall survival over ADT alone, and it, out, it was best in those patients who had high volume presentation. Um, more potent androgen targeting is definitely associated with improved overall survival over ADT alone, and with rare exception, patients should be on one of these combinations, and now we have the opportunity to include triplet therapy um, in their uh, treatment algorithm with the best overall survival really that we've seen. What we haven't really compared is the triple therapy to just the oral um, AR targeted therapy. And so until we have that information, we really don't know who should get the chemo or not. And so that you just have to stay tuned as we get more information on that. In terms of treating the primary, we talked about radiation for the low volume patients. And I think with that, I will um, uh, either take questions on this area or, or turn it over to Dr. Lawrence for the next run. Are there any questions in the audience? Is there anybody that still just wants to treat with like monotherapy, ADT alone? Yay, we're doing good. All right, thank you for your attention and uh, I think Dr. Lawrence will be up next. Oh, oh, it's David. Oh, Dr. Gerard's going to go next. Thank you, Mike. So we'll uh, do a little deeper dive into the utilization of some of these androgen receptor inhibitors. And the recognition that the androgen receptor uh, played a role in castration-resistant disease was really a major discovery that drove uh, the development of a lot of these agents. And again, these uh, pathway inhibitors are, are something that many urologists uh, utilize, uh, but it's important to uh, be aware of the side effects in changing indications and contraindications. So uh, we use these at multiple steps now. Uh, initially, we're utilized in castration-resistant disease, and now, uh, as Dr. Cookson pointed out, we're using them in metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer. So we'll talk a little bit, uh, touch on the mechanisms for castration-resistant disease development. Uh, we'll uh, discuss the existing and new applications for these oral androgen axis agents, and we'll talk about mechanisms and side effects, and some of the new insights into ADT and its side effects. So uh, to put this in context, a 72-year-old with metastatic castration-resistant disease, he had been treated with radiation therapy, developed a rising PSA, was placed on uh, LHRH uh, therapy, Testosterone is still castrate, uh, but his PSA is rising, and now he has new pelvic bony metastases and retroperitoneal lymph nodes. So what are options for this individual? Well, certainly it's recognized that the androgen receptor is over, uh, overexpressed in about 70% of metastases from men like this patient. 
And on the uh, left, you see the uh, androgen receptor overexpressed in tumor cells in the prostate. Uh, right, it's really demonstrating that in men that die of this disease, uh, amplification is found very commonly. Now, I don't really want to go into depth too much about this, but briefly point out there are a couple of mechanisms that are important that are ligand dependent. In the center, you see amplification of the androgen receptor. The more receptor around, uh, potentially binding more ligand. Uh, on the upper right is uh, the utilization of these tumors using adrenal androgens. And indeed, this is the mechanism for abiraterone's activity. Uh, on the left, you see uh, androgen receptor promiscuity. So there are actually mutations in the androgen receptor uh, that lead to its ability to bind glucocorticoids and other uh, types of hormones. And then on the far right is uh, androgen receptor uh, alterations. And uh, these variants, uh, such as ARV7, which is the best known, is, uh, can lead to auto-activation of the androgen receptor. As you see at the bottom, uh, apalutamide, darolutamide, enzalutamide, uh, all of these target AR binding in, in the cell. So abiraterone, its mechanism explains the side effects, and it's an irreversible inhibitor of the hydroxylase and lyase activities of CYP17A. So it blocks uh, this conversion uh, to DE, DHEA. There are increased levels of aldosterone as well as cortisol, and these can lead to uh, hypertension through uh, fluid retention, edema, low potassium. And it's important to realize that we have to give these drugs uh, with prednisone to offset these side effects. This uh, was originally validated uh, its use in castration-resistant disease, both pre-docetaxel chemotherapy and post-chemotherapy. And this study was now uh, eight years ago. The safety data um, uh, from this study demonstrates uh, those side effects that we would predict, and these include uh, increased liver function tests. And to minimize some of these side effects, uh, take it on an empty stomach, uh, give it prednisone, that's critical. There are, uh, it's important to check liver function tests routinely every two weeks after starting, and then monthly for, three, first, for the first three months and then quarterly. And if you do see this, stop the drug and restart at a lower dose. There are also routine assessments for hypertension and fluid retention. Our primary care uh, internists or doctors can help us manage this. And do remember some of the drug interactions uh, with Coumadin and other uh, CYP drugs. So uh, abiraterone is combined with androgen deprivation therapy and metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So, again, this drug is FDA approved for metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer before and after chemotherapy, and also for metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer uh, with androgen de deprivation therapy. Of note, it is also used in non metastatic castration resistant disease uh, in an off label approach. Side effects hypertension, hypokalemia, edema, and hyperglycemia, primarily related to the steroids. Uh, which candidates are poor candidates? So extrapolating uh, these comments, uh, obviously brittle diabetics, uh, individuals with gastric ulcers, rapidly progressive uh, disease infections, they wouldn't be able to tolerate this well. Uh, cardiac disease would be another contraindication as well as individuals with liver disease. So uh, these are the indications, again, for abiraterone. And when we talk about um, other agents, uh, these other AR signaling inhibitors function to block AR activity at multiple step uh, points along the pathway. So this includes binding of the androgens to the androgen receptor. Uh, this also inhibits nuclear translocation of the androgen receptor, as well as inhibiting the andro androgen receptor association uh, with DNA. And enzalut enzalutamide was the first that was rationally designed uh, as a second generation non-steroidal that is much more potent than the first generation ones such as biclutamide. Apalutamide and darolutamide have similar mechanisms of action uh, as enzalutamide. Enzalutamide uh, was first uh, validated in pre and post docetaxel leading to improved survival 
uh, decreased uh, overall survival, as well as uh, improved ra radiologic outcomes. Many of the side effects uh, that are noticeable with this include fatigue, so one needs to be aware of this in older individuals. Hot flashes, falls are also a significant issue as well. So uh, as far as minimizing and managing the side effects of enzalutamide, you can consider dose reductions uh, in the presence of other uh, SIP inhibitors. Uh, consider a dose reduction also if there's profound fatigue. You have to take care of patients that have a, his, a, a seizure history or on drugs that lower, lower this th threshold, such, a, such as a bupropion, uh, which is a cholesterol drug. Uh, I'm sorry, depression drug. And also dose holds can uh, help in uh, prior to restarting with a reduced uh, dose as well. And it's important to realize that enzalutamide is eight to nine days of the half-life. So which patients, uh, again, improved in castration-resistant disease, M0, CRPC, as well as metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer? Beware of the fatigue associated with these drugs, hypertension, con uh, constipation, uh, and there can be CNS effects as well. Uh, which patients are poor candidates for enzalutamide in these? Uh, history of seizures, strokes and falls, patients who have significant fatigue, uh, and many of those are advanced age. Our other uh, singling inhibitors include apalutamide, uh, which uh, has similar side effect profile as, pro profile as enzalutamide, in addition to hypothyroidism uh, and a rash. And then darolutamide, uh, there may potentially be less blood-brain barrier uh, penetration of this drug, so there might be potentially a little bit uh, of lower fatigue, seizures, and hypertension. So a big question becomes, what should you use first in patients with advanced disease? And there's really limited data to guiding between these. But uh, one uh, uh, aspect of our guidelines includes uh, the statement that you should avoid following one androgen singling agent with another of similar mechanisms. And um, I, this is very reasonable. There was, uh, there are unique situations when obviously one should consider chemotherapy sooner rather than later, and those are in individuals with rapid disease progression, significant symptoms, or visceral disease. And always uh, here in the United States, uh, there can be financial challenges with regard to the use of some of these drugs, which may also dictate what the patients receive. So again, a, a summary of uh, our second generation oral androgen receptor pathway inhibitors. It's important to know how these are applied. Uh, urologists are more likely to use this in the metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer setting. Just want to spend a couple of minutes talking about some of the adverse events with androgen deprivation therapy. Obviously, hot flashes are very common uh, with these medications. They can be mitigated using uh, venlafaxine or gabapentin uh, are two options. Osteoporosis, we'll talk some about bone health here. Uh, fatigue, exercise may help, uh, and it's been shown in randomized studies, to mitigate uh, that side effect. Uh, these individuals often complain of weight gain and after androgen deprivation therapy, and they're at increased risk for insulin resistance, uh, and the others we're familiar with. But I wanted to spend a moment just talking about cardiovascular disease. And uh, androgen deprivation therapy uh, clearly, it can affect uh, metabolic um, aspects of patients. And back in 2010, uh, with um, uh, Lupron, or LHR uh, agonists, uh, those that were being placed on these drugs uh, at the VA, it was found that about 30% of patients, over 30%, didn't get a comprehensive uh, cardiovascular assessment. A black spot, black box, box warning uh, was placed on these uh, drugs, uh, again, uh, emphasizing the importance of a cardiovascular workup, including uh, b blood pressure, lipids, bl blood glucose, and also screening and intervention to prevent issues with diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Uh, this is looking at some of the uh, cardiovascular morbidity with androgen deprivation therapy. There's a big question about whether these uh, GnRH agonists uh, have uh, a 
increased or decreased uh, uh, cardiovascular side effects related to the antagonist uh, relugalix, which is an oral agent. Uh, in a study, uh, the HERO study, there was uh, some data suggesting that uh, there, this was decreased with relugalix. Uh, in contrast, when you look at a lot of these randomized controlled trials, uh, we don't really see much difference between that. And in a more recent study, the pronounced study, which was really powered to look at uh, this issue of cardiovascular safety, there was really no difference uh, in major cardiac events uh, between these two classes of androgen deprivation therapy. So in summary, I think it's fine to put your patients on uh, both of these uh, drugs, both LH, RH um, agonists and as well as the antagonist. I will mention um, the use, and this is in our guidelines now, of uh, transdermal estradiol. This was uh, validated in the PATCH trial. One advantage about this is the reduction uh, in that box. Uh, you can see there's essentially a reduction in hot flashes with the use of uh, transdermal estradiol. The outcomes are the same as far as testosterone suppression. Uh, these patients do complain of, however, a significant amount of gynecomastia. So uh, the take-home points from this uh, section is their combination of androgen deprivation therapy and these pathway inhibitors, as well as plus or minus docetaxel, are now standard of care for metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer. Uh, enzalutamide, apalutamide, and darolutamide are androgen receptor signaling inhibitors. Again, these are preferred in patients uh, who can't tolerate systemic steroids, such as brittle diabetics uh, or individuals with liver disease uh, or gastric ulcers. Abiraterone is an androgen synthesis inhibitor, it inhibits CYP17, and that's uh, preferred in patients who otherwise can't really tolerate these other drugs. And as far as monitoring uh, for cardiovascular disease, uh, metabolic disturbances, it's important in these patients uh, in order to avoid uh, uh, further issues uh, with regard to their general health. So I'll stop here. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about treatment intensification and uh, moving into castration-resistant disease. Perfect. Good afternoon. Appreciate everybody being here. My name is Will Lorentz. Um, I chair the, the AUA's Advanced Guideline. Um, committee. So the guideline first came out uh, in 2020, and then this year, just a few months ago, we completed an update because, if, as Dr. Cookson mentioned, a lot of things have, have happened uh, since we published the, the initial guideline. So I'm going to focus on the last two disease states today, um, the non-metastatic CRPC patient and then the CRPC, the metastatic CRPC patient, and go through kind of what the old guidelines said and then what some of the new changes are. And then we're gonna give time at the end for questions uh, for, for all of us. Um, the aim of this guideline obviously is to provide evidence-based medicine um, to you all to help, um, help you treat men with advanced prostate cancer. And what do we mean by advanced prostate cancer? This is a slide similar to what Dr. Cookson showed you, but basically once you have exhausted all local therapy from there forward, that's, can, that's what we're considering advanced prostate cancer. And so that means men that have a biochemical recurrence and no evidence of, of metastatic disease to those with metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer, and then those with non-metastatic CRPC and those with metastatic CRPC. So there are a few key definitions. I'm not gonna spend much time on this. I do wanna point out at the bottom, the high volume metastatic disease, um, that basically, we it's ways that we can kind of risk stratify who are the, the higher risk patients. Um, that's the charted definition and it's basically um, those with visceral metastases um, or metastases greater than or equal to four bony <coughs> sites with at least one of those sites being outside the pelvis or the vertebral column. And then the latitude definition of high risk metastatic disease, it, it sh if you have two out of three of these factors, you're gonna have a, a poor prognosis and that's basically um, either your primary disease is Gleason 8 or higher, you have greater than or equal to three bony lesions, or there's, or there's measurable visceral, visceral metastasis. Just want to quickly point out, um, 
although the urologist is still front and center in taking care of, of these advanced prostate cancer patients, the importance of a multidisciplinary team is more important than ever. Medical oncologists have an uh, enlarging an expanding role in taking care of these patients. Dr. Cookson mentioned the importance of having genetic counselors because later on in the stage of the disease, most of these patients should have germline and somatic testing. And then obviously radiation oncologists, palliative care, um, all of those are important parts. So initially in evaluating these patients, it's important to obtain a tissue diagnosis either from the primary site or a metastatic site. Sometimes you could argue one of both. Um, that can be helpful for somatic testing. It's obviously helpful for confirming the diagnosis. Um, and then when we're talking initially to these patients about treatment, it's important to incorporate their comorbidities, what's their estimated life expectancy, and then obviously what are the patient preferences for treatment because there are a lot of options out there and a lot of these medications have significant side effects and are gonna impact the patient's quality of life moving forward. And then don't forget to ask about pain and um, optimize pain control and whether you need to involve palliative care to help with that. So here are the four disease states we talked about. I'm gonna focus the next uh, 15 minutes or so on states three and four, the non-metastatic CRPC and the metastatic CRPC patients. So non-metastatic CRPC patients, um, it's men with a rising PSA, but they have um, no evidence of metastatic disease on their conventional imaging. Um, we recommend serial PSAs every three to six months in these patients and then conventional imaging six to 12 months. And we're, I'm gonna talk about conventional imaging versus PET in just a minute. So one of the um, new additions to the guidelines with the amendment was number 21 here where we say use of conventional um, imaging or PSA PSMA PET imaging every six to 12 months. Um, and, and that's important, um, we'll, we'll get to that, but it's also gonna be important utilize, whether we utilize PET imaging, PSMA PET imaging in men with CRPC, and especially those who are looking for radio ligand treatment options, and we'll discuss that in a minute. So for our non-metastatic CRPC patients, for the last several years, we have had FDA approved um, three agents that we can now use in this space. It's apalutamide, doralutamide, and enzalutamide. And in general, although um, it's not part of the, the FDA um, indication for using uh, these agents, but it's typically for those at higher risk of developing metastases. And we, <coughs> we categorize people as higher risk as those with a PSA doubling time of 10 months or less. They're at higher risk for developing metastatic disease and death from prostate cancer. So these three agents, I'm gonna quickly go through the trials, the phase three trials that um, led to their approval. So for apalutamide, it was the Spartan trial and it showed a metastasis-free survival um, of you know, considerably 16.2 months for placebo versus, versus 40 months for the agent. Um, in terms of darlutamide, the RMS trial, over 1,500 patients, and you see a very similar metastasis-free survival benefit for those treated with darlutamide versus placebo. And then looking at the enzalutamide data, the PROSPER trial, again, 1,400 patients, and you see an uh, impressive difference, 14.7 versus 36.6. Uh, months uh, advantage in development of metastasis-free survival. Also, um, in uh, the enzalutamide trial, the PROSPER trial, you actually see an overall survival benefit as well, 56.3 months versus 67 months. So all three of these agents have shown um, uh, metastasis-free survival benefit in those patients with non-metastatic CRPC um, and we think the, the largest benefit is those that have a PSA doubling time of less than or equal to 10 months. Now, um, the guidelines recommend observation, or at least considering observation, uh, and continued androgen, standard androgen deprivation in men who have a longer PSA doubling time, so over 10 months. And then guideline number 24 recommends do not treat these men with systemic chemotherapy or immunotherapy unless it's within the context of a clinical trial. So now let's move on to that fourth disease state, which is metastatic CRPC. And pretty basic first guideline statement in this category recommends um, baseline labs assess for disease-related symptoms. Importantly, you need to assess for the patient's um, 
functional status, so their performance status, typically we'll use ECOG. But that's important because some of the, some of the indications uh, for the agents that are in this category um, are specifically related to whether or not they have a good functional status or not. It's tough to give systemic chemotherapy to someone with an ECOG of, of two or three. And then we're going to touch briefly on germline and somatic testing and the recommendations there. So in these metastatic CRPC patients, even without PSA progression or new symptoms, clinicians should perform imaging at least annually. The reason for that is in the PREVAIL trial, which was the trial that looked at enzalutamide in the pre-chemotherapy, so in patients who had not received docetaxel, they found that 24.5% of men actually showed radiographic pr progression even though there was no PSA progression. So in these patients, it's important to, to do routine imaging even if their PSA is not changing. And then guideline uh, number 27, uh, there's recommendations for obtaining a PSMA PET in these patients if they are considering lutetium treatment. That's radioligand uh, treatment. And it's basically going to be in patients who have received docetaxel and have also had an androgen pathway inhibitor, such as an abiraterone or an enzalutamide. So if you're considering doing lutetium treatment in these patients, then the recommendation is obviously to get a PSMA PET scan. Do they have a bright lesion that you can then uh, target for treatment. And that's all based on the vision trial. Um, basically, this was um, lutetium versus, lutetium plus standard of care versus just standard of care. And we see progression-free survival, uh, an impressive uh, progression-free survival benefit, and then also an overall survival benefit. Um, and there was delay in first skeletal event in the patients that, that got um, lutetium. What about germline testing? So in all patients with metastatic CRPC, um, we should offer um, germline if it's not already been done, as well as somatic um, genetic testing in these patients. And the reason for that is we're trying to identify whether or not there's a DNA repair deficiency or what is the micro uh, satellite instability status. And all of those, that genetic testing will potentially have impact on how we treat those patients. It'll have impact on potentially their prognosis. Um, how, you know, are they at higher risk for progression or, or moving to, on to death from their prostate cancer? And then obviously it has an impact for their family members as well. If someone's uh, found to have a germline BRCA1 or 2 um, um, gene, then that has important implications for uh, their family members. We know um, from this study that was in the New England Journal that about 12% of patients with um, metastatic prostate cancer will be found to have a DNA repair mutation, and I think that number is uh, surprising uh, to a lot of people. It's higher than, than what I initially thought it would be. So in this metastatic CRPC patient population, there are a host of agents that we have to treat them, and I'm going to go through each of these. Uh, but really, there's been an explosion since 2004 of, of agents that we can use in this, this space. Um, obviously, um, everyone with metastatic CRP, uh, CRPC should be on continued standard androgen deprivation therapy. And then kind of first line would be the addition of abiraterone, uh, docetaxel or enzalutamide. The reality is a lot of these patients have already been treated with these agents, and so the sequencing um, of how we treat uh, metastatic CRPC patients has, has gotten quite complicated. This is a similar, or the same slide that, that Dr. Gerard already showed, but abiraterone basically is a CYP17 inhibitor, so it, it blocks um, downstream androgen production. What led to the approval of abiraterone was the Cougar trials, 301 and 302. 301 was the pre, uh, sorry, was the post chemotherapy, so patients had already been treated with docetaxel chemotherapy, and what you saw was a survival, an overall survival benefit with abiraterone, and then it was tested also in the pre chemo patient population, and again, you see a similar survival uh, advantage there. Moving on to enzalutamide, um, it has a similar. Uh, mechanism of action to apalutamide and darlutamide. Um, it's an uh, uh, androgen receptor pathway inhibitor, blocks androgen receptor in, in multiple levels. Um, it was approved in initially the FIRM trial, which was the post-chemo, meaning patients had already been treated with docetaxel and progressed and showed a 13.6 months versus 18-month 
um, overall survival advantage in those patients. It was then tested in the PREVAIL trial, which was the pre-chemo, meaning those patients had not received docetaxel and again showed about a two and a half month survival benefit there. So docetaxel is the, the first line chemotherapy um, and it's been approved since 2003, 2004 with the um, TAX-327 trial, which uh, at the time showed a survival benefit of about three or three and a half months over um, uh, mitoxantrone. We've obviously moved on quite a bit from there, and, and you've heard a lot today about doublet and triplet uh, therapy that incorporates docetaxel chemotherapy. Um, importantly, in patients who are asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic, uh, clinicians may use Cyplus LT. Um, the IMPACT trial, just over 500 patients, showed um, about a four-month survival, overall survival benefit in those patients that were treated with this immunotherapy. Um, importantly, the comparator there was placebo. Um, for patients that have primarily bone metastases, so um, they need to have no visceral disease and no lymphadenopathy greater than three centimeters, but radium 223, which is an alpha particle emitter, uh, is, is an option for treatment as well. And you can see, I have highlighted there that it was effective uh, in both patients who have received docetaxel and those who have not. Uh, and overall, you see a 14.9 month versus 11.3 month survival benefit. So what about 17 LU PSMA 617 or lutetium? So clinicians should offer this to patients with progressive metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer who have previously received docetaxel and an androgen uh, inhibitor and who have a PSMA positive lesion on PET scan. So these are heavily treated patients that do have a PSMA positive uh, lesion on their scan. Um, there's, there's strong recommendation uh, that these patients should be treated. The vision trial, I showed those data earlier. Um, we see both a um, um, progression-free survival benefit um, as well as uh, an overall survival benefit as well as a delay in skeletal-related events. Um, the last few, what about second-line chemotherapy? So carbazitaxel should be offered in patients who have, have undergone prior docetaxel treatment with something like an enzalutamide or an abiraterone, and there's strong, there's strong evidence to support that. That was the TROPIC trial, um, which enrolled over 750 men and showed survival benefit um, in those who received carbazitaxel in that second-line chemotherapy space. So we talked earlier about <clears throat> germline and somatic um, uh, genetic testing, and why do we do that? Well, for patients that um, are found to have um, uh, to have a um, uh, a def say a BRCA1 or 2 or an ATM uh, gene, PARP inhibitors are indicated uh, for treatment in those patients. If for some reason they can't receive a PARP inhibitor, then there's some evidence to show that cisplatinum or platinum-based chemotherapy can be used in these folks that do have um, homologous recombination repair defects. What about uh, the use of, of um, immunotherapy checkpoint inhibitors. So guideline statement 36 states that mismatch repair deficient or microsatellite instability high patients with metastatic um, CRPC can be offered pembrolizumab. Uh, I think the reality is that um, we haven't seen as strong an effect of the checkpoint inhibitors in advanced prostate cancer as say uh, something like renal cancer or even um, uh, urothelial cancer, but in these select patients that, that have microsatellite instability high, um, they can be treated or should be offered uh, pembrolizumab. And you can see the profound study was what showed a laparlib, uh, gave a survival advantage to patients that specifically had BRC, BRCA1 or 2 or ATM uh, mutations. So sequencing is a real um, dilemma for all of us. I, I certainly don't have any great answers for you. Dr. Gerard um, touched on it. I think um, it, it, it's, it's common sense right now. If patients have progressed through an androgen pathway signaling inhibitor, it makes sense to try something different. I think the importance of genetic testing and maybe guiding those patients, those advanced patients that are candidates for a PARP inhibitor um, that makes sense. And then obviously you've already heard docetaxel for those certainly with higher risk disease by whatever definition you're using, 
um, should be considered for upfront, um, you know, at least doublet or triplet therapy. So the AUA um, net.org website has um, all of our guidelines and this new guideline um, is there as well. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge our entire um, advanced prostate cancer guideline panel and the AUA staff as well. Um, Dr. Keibel, are you up next or is Dr. Gerard back? You're back? Okay, thank you for your attention. Okay, so we'll uh, dive a little bit deeper into chemotherapy now. Uh, it's important to be aware of these uh, chemotherapy options and side effects for these patients with advanced prostate cancer, uh, mainly because the an earlier use of uh, docetaxel for metastatic hormone sensitive prostate cancer uh, is something that we should uh, potentially be aware of. So chemotherapy is being utilized earlier in the disease uh, at, at multiple steps now and it's a crowded space. We'll talk about its uh, use in hormone-sensitive prostate cancer. We'll talk about choosing between docetaxel versus an androgen receptor pathway inhibitor, uh, the role of uh, triplet, triplet, triplet therapy. And then in castration-resistant disease, we'll talk about uh, cabazitaxel, touch on that, some of the mechanisms of action, and talk about uh, neuroendocrine and de-differentiation as well. Uh, finishing up with several biomarkers that we should be aware of. These are the guideline recommendations for 2023, uh, and we'll be talking about uh, androgen deprivation therapy plus dostaxol plus darolutamide, uh, the triplet therapy, as well as being aware that there may be a subset of patients with smaller volume cancer uh, that oligometastatic disease that may be candidates for ADT plus radiation to the primary tumor. So uh, it's of interest here in the United States that uh, previously about 3% of all new prostate cancer diagnoses uh, were uh, metastatic, but now that has risen to 8%. Uh, these patients, as far as uh, with AD androgen deprivation therapy alone, typically the median overall survival was about three years. Uh, in these newer trials, though, uh, we're seeing markedly improved survival of up to 50 to 60 months, the median sur uh, overall survival. So it's clear that this kind of treatment intensification is leading to an improvement in survival. It's important to also be aware of quality of life, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the studies looking at that. So the backbone of treatment is taxane chemotherapy. This uh, is both docetaxel and its analog cabazitaxel. Uh, these drugs bind to tubulin uh, and in inducing its formation while sim simultaneously inhibiting their disassembly, so essentially locking the cell uh, in replication. This results in, a, in the inhibition of mitotic and interphase cellular functions. The charted trial showed an overall treatment improvement uh, of about 14, uh, of about 10 months in, when you looked at the whole population. And this was really remarkable uh, when this study was published. Previously, all of the advanced disease studies had really only demonstrated three to four uh, to, to two a month improvements in survival. Further stratification based on the number of metastases uh, into both high and low volume disease really demonstrated that, that those patients with high volume metastatic disease were the ones that benefited the most uh, with up to a uh, 16 to 17 month improvement. So we uh, touched on this. Uh, again, it's important to be aware of high versus low volume disease. Again, high volume disease being the presence of visceral metastases or four or more bone lesions. And it's important to realize that this is different from the definition of oligometastatic disease, which essentially is how many metastases you can reasonably treat with radiation. And most of that uh, is pelvic disease. Uh, in the red box here, we see the two uh, phase three trials, randomized controlled trials of androgen deprivation therapy plus a docetaxel chemotherapy, both, both profoundly positive. So how is this given? 
So at the current time, uh, it's given docetaxel with androgen deprivation therapy is given as an IV infusion uh, every three weeks. Uh, there's, not, there's no concurrent prednisone that's given. Dose reductions are permissible. Uh, the androgen deprivation therapy uh, can be given with or without bicalutamide. Uh, intermittent ADT is not allowed. And again, for the androgen deprivation therapy, no dose reductions are allowed. Starting both of these drugs at once tends to increase side effects. So often the androgen deprivation therapy is started uh, before the docetaxel is initiated. Uh, disease evaluation should be every three weeks uh, with bone scan, CT scan, uh, or PSMA PET uh, at uh, baseline and then at the development of uh, pr clinical progression. So some of the toxicities that are most marked include febrile neutropenia, uh, fatigue, and a number of these patients get uh, neuropathy as well as uh, they can also get um, uh, stomatitis and, and diarrhea. Uh, this is interesting uh, that docetaxel is better tolerated in the hormone-sensitive prostate cancer setting than in a castrate-resistant disease setting. In part, uh, the patients tend to be healthier and more chemo-fit. So how do we choose between uh, chemo-hormonal therapy versus an AR pathway inhibitor? So this is looking at the STAMPEDE trial, which is a multi-arm uh, trial that uh, in which they were able to compare these two arms. And what you see here is that uh, with regard to failure-free survival and progression-free survival, there was an advantage uh, to using oral inhibitors. Again, this doesn't really stratify patients based on volume of disease. Uh, as far as overall survival was concerned, however, there was really no difference uh, between these two approaches in this stampede uh, multi-arm trial. As far as global quality of life, uh, with chemotherapy, you can see a marked decrease in quality of life, uh, but then it improves back to the baseline. And one advantage about uh, docetaxel versus uh, one of these androgen pathway inhibitors is, again, this is given for a period of uh, six months, and then essentially the patient is through with that arm of therapy. So instead of being consistently exposed to the side effects, uh, of this drug, uh, they're able to be stopped, uh, it's able to stop. So all patients should be offered treatment intensification at this point, uh, and no patients should really be getting androgen deprivation therapy. Now we're all cognizant of the fact that there are some patients that may have very slow uh, rates of disease progression, uh, may be very elderly with other health problems in which uh, we may not necessarily add additional uh, drugs uh, but certainly in, in um, patients with uh, five to 10 year life expectancies, we should consider treatment intensification. Docetaxel uh, is the least expensive. Uh, these patients have to be chemo fit. Uh, Abiraterone is a generic at this point. Uh, we talked about some of the side effects associated with it and the requirement for intensive monitoring and liver function tests and electrolytes. Uh, enzalutamide uh, is slightly more expensive. Uh, there's less, mon lo less monitoring. Uh, there can be neurocognitive issues with it. And uh, similarly, apalutamide, uh, uh, this has a similar spectrum as enzalutamide, but also has this rash. So triplet therapy, this paper was published at the end of 2022 looking at uh, the Arison's trial, a uh, uh, three-arm trial, basically ADT and docetaxel, and then those patients were randomized to either getting darolutamide, uh, plus or minus darolutamide. And it reduced the risk of death by uh, 32%. Uh, you can see the overall survival curve there on the left. Uh, there were also improvements in multiple other uh, 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 clinical endpoints. The side effects were worse with uh, darolutamide with regard to fatigue, uh, but otherwise uh, the, the arms were fairly similar. The most uh, significant uh, adverse events included neutropenia and febrile uh, neutropenia as well as hypertension and anemia. Uh, so these, uh, this is, was a study that, again, many of our medical oncologists are, and are grappling with. Uh, who are the patients that may be most appropriate for them? Is it high volume, rapidly progression, rapid progression? Uh, this is an ongoing question. 
The Arisons trial uh, we've just talked about, uh, the Peace One trial uh, uh, has been mentioned, and again, uh, it demonstrated docetaxel plus or minus abiraterone uh, plus ADT uh, uh, led to a survival advantage. So uh, it's important to realize that this may be over-treatment for some patients. Again, slow rates of progression, a more minimal metastatic disease. Obviously, this is going to increase the cost to our patients as well. And it does require these patients to be chemo-fit to undergo triplet therapy. So uh, again, these are our guideline recommendations uh, for metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer. So we'll shift now into castration-resistant disease and chemotherapy. Uh, this is a patient who had radiation therapy but developed a rising PSA shortly after treatment. He uh, was treated uh, with LHRH agonist and abiraterone, and his PSA natured at 0 0.8, but then began rapidly rising with a doubling time of three months. He now presents with multiple osteoblastic lesions in the spine, uh, a new liver lesion, in a PSA of 56. So what are the treatment options for this patient? Well, certainly, uh, Ciplicil T uh, wouldn't really be an option in this patient given his rapidly progressive disease and symptomatic bony, uh, bony mets. Uh, because of the uh, visceral disease, uh, radium-223 uh, would not be a good option. Uh, so one question would be whether to reintroduce docetaxel or whether cabazitaxel might be an option for this patient. Uh, lutetium uh, would be a, a third one. Uh, this is uh, the current uh, version of the NCCN guidelines that were published uh, four months ago. Uh, this lists a number of the options we just mentioned. Uh, mentioned. But there are a couple of prin clinical principles that are important to uh, think about with these patients. And clinical factors are still very important with regard to, predicting, with regard to choosing the next uh, treatment option for these patients. Again, don't want to necessarily follow an antigen receptor pathway inhibitor with another one. Uh, what options are available where I practice? Uh, are there vis visceral metastases or these bone only? Uh, and again, that may uh, direct the use of uh, radium uh, versus uh, other options. Is the candidate a, ch a chemotherapy candidate? Uh, they may be, uh, have very poor ECOG performance status and perhaps an antigen receptor pathway inhibitor alone might be the best option for this patient. Is there any evidence of a, a discrepancy between tumor volume and the PSA suggesting neuroendocrine or small cell differentiation? And are there targetable uh, mutations in this patient as well? So uh, as we mentioned, docetaxel was initially uh, applied to patients in castration-resistant disease. And I, I actually remember how this happened during my career. Prior to this, all we had was mitoxantrone, and uh, that was actually the control arm of this. Um, they called it blue thunder uh, because the drug was bright blue, and it, and it really didn't do much for the patients, uh, the mitoxantrone. But uh, this provided a three-month survival advantage, which at the time really changed the, the way we approached the disease. Uh, some of the Comorbidities of concern with docetaxel, we talked a little bit about these. Performance uh, status is important, and often patients will improve with regard to their performance status uh, once their disease begins to get treated. Uh, they can have uh, volume overload issues, uh, fluid retention, uh, the peripheral neuropathy is an issue. They can get some um, uh, obstruction of their um, uh, ducts in their eyes, leading to dry eye. Uh, it's important to monitor uh, liver function tests in these patients and, and be aware of uh, arrhythmias in these patients as well as uh, brittle, brittle diabetics. So who are the ideal patients, uh, castration-resistant prostate cancer patients? For docetaxel, symptomatic disease, uh, patients with visceral disease, uh, liver metastases, uh, rapidly progressive, and you generally want to use after at least one second generation androgen pathway inhibitor. And it's important to remember in these patients too, uh, that, that was pointed out, that biopsy is important to see if these patients are candidates for some of the newer approved drugs uh, that are uh, microsatellite instability, uh, have microsatellite instability or DNA uh, repair deficient genes like BRCA. 
So um, as we mentioned, it's used in uh, hormone sensitive disease. Uh, there was also uh, of, of note, it's used in neoadjuvant as a neoadjuvant approach in uh, patients before surgery. Uh, this was the phase three punch, punch trial in which the patients got six cycles of chemotherapy prior to prostatectomy. And there was a modest improvement uh, in biochemical free uh, survival as well as metastasis free survival. Uh, but I'd point out that this is not a guideline approved at this point, uh, and uh, there are other options that are being examined in this space. But I think as we move forward, uh, the neoadjuvant approach in high-risk patients is something that we'll likely uh, be seeing more of. So uh, for this patient we were talking about, uh, an option might be cabazitaxel. Uh, the tropic trial uh, in post-docetaxel patients demonstrated an improvement in survival. So why would you use another taxane if you uh, already failed docetaxel? Well, cabazitaxel was actually uh, optimized for uh, patient, or in, in culture, actually, uh, for docetaxel resistance. And indeed, it led to a three-month improvement in survival and approval of this drug. Uh, the Pro Procelica study demonstrated that you can avoid some of the toxicity with cabazitaxel by dropping the dose down to 20 milligrams per milliliter. And then finally, uh, there was a more recent trial, a CARD trial, that uh, was published uh, several years ago where patients were randomized to get either cabazitaxel in prednisone or abiraterone in enzalutamide after a failure of an androgen uh, receptor um, uh, inhibitor. And uh, this looked at quality of life, uh, uh, progression-free, um, and overall survival. And uh, cabazitaxel actually, uh, uh, actually improved uh, uh, recurrence pr progression-free survival as well as over su overall survival in these patients uh, when compared to the control arm. So uh, again, this emphasizes that just following with another androgen receptor inhibitor uh, after the failure of docetaxel is, it, it is not necessarily a, um, the approach to take. And cabazitaxel doesn't really lead to more significant or serious side effects. Uh, you can look at the, the fairly similar between the two arms uh, and fairly similar grade three adverse events as well. So in summary, cabazitaxel is a drug that should be in our armamentarium, uh, approved for docetaxel failures. It has similar cancer responses, similar side effect profile as docetaxel does. Uh, patients do need prophylactic growth factor support when getting these drugs. And it is an option uh, as initial chemotherapy after androgen uh, receptor uh, pathway inhibitor failure. The, uh, some patients, interestingly, do tolerate this drug better than docetaxel, as it does have a slightly si uh, different side effect profile. So uh, I mentioned metastatic biopsy. Uh, situations in which to consider this, uh, visceral metastases, especially liver metastases, extremely bulky lymph nodes, uh, low PSA in the setting of very high volume disease, and then uh, primarily a lytic or blastic uh, bone metastases. And one question becomes, what should you biopsy in this setting? And often it's what's, whatever's most available and safest for the patient, be it uh, a, a, a lymph node biopsy or if the prostate is still present, uh, that uh, can also be an option. And the molecular testing of this biopsy uh, tissue is important uh, because the question arises, is this still an adenocarcinoma? There can be these androgen indifferent castration resistant prostate cancer variants that arise. These are very rare in primary disease, small cell or neuroendocrine. Uh, again, we're seeing more of this disease, type of disease after AR targeted therapy. And there are a couple of different uh, subtypes, carcinoid, small cell uh, carcinoma, 
But what we're seeing more of right now is uh, neuroendocrine uh, disease, neuroendocrine features, and it's uh, estimated to arise in about 13 uh, to 25 percent of uh, patients uh, that are dying of the disease. They do express these neuroendocrine markers like synaptophysin, acromogranin. Staining for this is shown on the uh, right. Uh, this is actually the prostate from a patient with neuroendocrine disease that developed it after AR pathway inhibitor. Uh, typically, these are androgen receptor negative and lack PSA secretion. So the patient may be feeling worse, having a worse performance status, increased pain, and the PSA may not necessarily be going up. In the situation of uh, a small cell, uh, you treat these essentially like a small cell lung cancer with a platinum doublet, uh, such as cisplatinum or carboplatinum uh, with the toposide. So I'll briefly mention biomarkers uh, for chemotherapy treatment in advanced pro pro prostate cancer. And we now have a developing arsenal of uh, options for precision oncology. Uh, I'm just going to mention uh, uh, when you have a DNA repair deficient disease, uh, such as BRCA2 or ATM, uh, PARP inhibitors uh, should be used. And uh, Dr. Keibel will be talking more about this. Uh, mismatch repair gene defects as well. Uh, these patients, uh, w this would lead to the utilization of a PD-1 inhibitor. But what I'd like to talk a little bit more about are these uh, androgen receptor splice variants. So essentially, these are uh, truncated versions of the androgen receptor. And as you can see on the left, uh, the androgen receptor has the N-terminal binding domain, uh, the DNA bind binding domain in the middle, and then on the far right is the ligand binding domain where the androgen uh, androgens bind. And these essentially have a truncated version of that, so they don't bind androgens, and they're essentially auto-activating uh, when they bind to the DNA. And what this has been shown is that there, uh, this leads to res uh, resistance uh, to enzalutamide and abiraterone. And these are uh, waterfall plots looking at patients. Uh, basically, if you are AR uh, V7 negative, uh, you're much more likely to have a uh, no response uh, to these uh, these drugs. So one can use utilize uh, this type of test uh, to determine resistance uh, to these AR pathway inhibitors and potentially think about uh, chemotherapy in this setting. Final thing I'll mention is performance status. Uh, there are several different ways of assessing this. Uh, one is the ECOG performance status, and we should be familiar with these approaches to describing uh, patient activity. Uh, patients that are restricted to a wheelchair for half the time uh, are essentially an ECOG uh, 2 or higher, and uh, this is uh, something that needs to be documented and can help predict outcomes uh, as well as uh, responses to chemotherapy. So uh, this is a very nice nomogram uh, that was generated in 2014, and it takes into account several features, including LDH, uh, performance status, uh, PSA, uh, hemoglobin, and uh, other features uh, that can help us predict patient uh, survival. So uh, as far as take-home points, treatment intensification in metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer uh, should be offered to all eligible patients. Uh, in patients planned for upfront docetaxel, the addition of abiraterone or darolutamide as triplet therapy uh, is associated with overall survival and is something that is, uh, we should be aware of. Docetaxel remains a first-line chemotherapy for metastatic castration-resistant disease, and it's generally used uh, after oral inhibitors, uh, but occasionally in patients with rapidly progressive disease, visceral disease, bulky disease, uh, it may be used uh, uh, before them or in combination with them. Uh, capacitaxol is an option we should uh, continue to think of. Uh, we do have three new biomarkers that can help guide specific treatments. And then finally, ECOG performance status and comorbidities uh, for all our patients uh, should help guide appropriate selection. So I'll stop there, um, and certainly if there are any questions, we can take those on the chat. But otherwise, uh, I'll introduce Dr. Keibel. Thank you. You guys got staying power. I'll give that to you. 
So I'm the last person who stands between you and a beer. Let's see what's gonna, which one am I doing first? Okay, we're gonna do bone health first, okay? So with bone health is critical to our management of patients with advanced prostate cancer, and something in which I, I believe strongly the urologist really plays a central role. So uh, the issue is, is bone loss. Elderly men are at increased risk for bone mineral disease, and uh, ADT is associated with bone mineral density. There's an increase in risk of osteoporosis and fracture, and patients lose about 2 to 4% of their bone mineral density in the first year on androgen deprivation. And the fracture risk increases from 21 to 54% during their lifetime while they're on androgen deprivation. And uh, the, uh, the, the issue of bone metastases also increases the risk, because patients obviously can have a fracture. The risk factors are those that all of our patients have, right? Uh, they're older, They've, many of them had previous fractures, uh, a, a parental history of a hip fracture, low body weight, current cigarette smoking, critical, uh, and excessive alcohol consumption. And then some, there are some uh, risk factors that are specific for prostate cancer patients, uh, GnRH suppression, uh, glucocorticoids, radiation therapy, and other medications like proton pump inhibitors. I think this is just an important slide that basically shows there's a dose response effect. You put somebody on a short dose of androgen deprivation therapy, they're much less likely to have not only a, uh, any fracture, but also a fracture that results in hospitalization. And as you increase the intensity of the treatment through longer, uh, longer duration of androgen deprivation, you see that the risk actually increases substantially. And uh, survival is associated with fracture. So if you look at men uh, on androgen dep deprivation with a history of uh, a fracture, they live uh, a shorter length of time than men with no history of skeletal fractures. Uh, it's important to do a baseline test when you put somebody on androgen deprivation just to get an idea of where they are. Uh, so that's with a DEXA scan. Uh, and to get blood tests, understand what their calcium, creatinine, and importantly, their vitamin D levels are. Vitamin D levels are really important. Uh, and then you obviously recommend uh, smoking cessation, alcohol moderation, and weight-bearing exercise to allow them to increase the strength of their bone. So uh, vitamin D and calcium, there are really no recommendations about the amount that you should have. Uh, the Bone Health and Osteoporosis Foundation have guidelines. They recommend 1,000 milligrams per day for people in the 50 to 70 year age range. Uh, and then uh, calcium increases to about 1,200 milligrams when they're greater than 60. And vitamin D, it's between 800 and 1,000. And the dose actually does matter. So this is a meta-analysis from several years ago. Uh, if you have about 400 units, that's the top. Uh, you have, excuse me, the bottom, you have no uh, improvement in terms of your risk of fracture. But when you get a higher dose, which is closer to seven to 800, there's actually a relative risk, a reduction of about 25%, uh, not only for hip fractures, but also for non-vertebral fractures. Calcium is also important uh, in preventing bone mineral density loss. Uh, there's conflicting data on calcium and the risk of prostate cancer. Probably shouldn't get too much into that but, uh, right now, but the bottom line is these patients already in general have very advanced disease, so I don't think uh, decreasing the amount of calcium they have is really going to have any impact on their prostate cancer mortality. It's particularly important to supplement when treating with zoledronic acid and vitamin D, excuse me, zoledronic acid and denosumab. I'm going to get more data on this, but this can cause profound decrease in calcium levels, and so you need to supplement. Uh, it's better absorption with divided doses, so you don't give it all at once. And a calcium citrate uh, is uh, better absorbed than calcium carbonate. So zoledronic acid is the bisphosphonate that I think most of us are most familiar with. It is not the only one. It's important to recognize that. It's given as an IV infusion, and uh, it's the only uh, uh, bisphosphonate who has been specifically demonstrated to have a benefit in castrate, uh, excuse me, metastatic castrate-resistant prostate cancer by decreasing the skeletal-related event rate uh, compared to placebo. There are some significant toxicities associated with this drug. So osteoporosis, hypocalcemia, nephrotoxicity, and flu-like syndromes. So with zoledronic acid, it's really important to, to modify the dose on the basis of renal function. So uh, I, I have the figure up here. I see a lot of you taking pictures. It's obviously in your syllabus. But if you're giving this dose and the patient has a decrease uh, in renal function, you have to decrease the dose. And I think that's one of the reasons why denosumab has become more favored uh, among uh, urologists. Uh, but in other countries, they tend to use a lot more uh, zoledronic acid. So uh, the human mo it's a, uh, denosumab is a human monoclonal antibody, a rank lig ligand inhibitor. Uh, it essentially inhibits osteoclasted 
uh, excuse me, osteoclast mediated bone destruction, so the bone becomes more stable. It's given as a sub Q injection, uh, and it has very similar toxicity to zolandronic acid. The big difference is you don't have to worry about renal, uh, the renal function. So this is a picture of osteonecrosis of the jaw. Uh, if uh, you, uh, there's going to be exposed bone in the maxillofacial area that occurs in association mostly with dental surgery, uh, or also some sort of uh, ill-fitting denture or uh, tooth decay. And uh, it generally, it doesn't heal. That's the problem. So the best thing is prevention. And the best way to prevent it is by when you're going to put somebody on one of these drugs, send them to a dentist, make sure that their teeth are in good shape. Because once they're on the drug, it's really, uh, it's really a problem. These are the risk factors, again, uh, risk factors that most of our patients have. So to minimize excellent oral hygiene is, as I outlined, was the best prophylaxis. Limit alcohol and tobacco use. I think it's hard to think of any, any uh, physician that recommends excessive alcohol and tobacco use. Uh, obtain dental consult, just like I outlined, and they really should be seeing a dentist regularly so this doesn't get out of control. And, and pulling teeth is probably the worst thing you can do. Uh, if it develops while they're on therapy, uh, you know, m much of this is uh, uh, not, not, there's no randomized trials or anything like that looking at how to manage this. Uh, but really you want to try and hold the bisphosphonate or the denosumab until it's healed or stabilized. It's important to recognize that, that with, with uh, bisphosphonates, the bone mineral density will stay constant. But uh, I don't have any data in here, but denosumab is found to have some rebound where the patients start losing bone very rapidly when they come off of this. So be very careful and just sort of stopping denosumab cold turkey. Uh, the antibiotics, oral rinses, pain control, and in cases that are really refractory, you have to send them to hyperbaric oxygen. So which should it be for your patient? Well, uh, it's, uh, you know, there is a dub double line randomized trial. Uh, about 1,000, excuse me, 2,000 men with metastatic castrate-resistant prostate cancer, and denos, excuse me, denosumab appears to be slightly better uh, in terms of fracture risk, but there was no difference in overall survival or time to disease progression. Uh, denosumab versus olandronic trial results, uh, very similar side effects, hypocalcemia, osteonecrosis of the jaw. They seem to be a little bit more with denosumab than zolandronic acid, which I think reflects the fact that it's probably a slightly stronger medicine. Do disease fractures affect mortality? And the answer overwhelmingly is yes. That's why we really need to pay attention to this as urologists. So this is a study using SEER data of about 50,000 patients who were started on androgen deprivation. Uh, they underwent a DEXA screening, and then they looked at fracture rates, bisphosphonates, and survival. And what you can see is there were about 4,000 of these men who underwent DEXA screening. About 20 percent of these of the overall cohort developed a fracture, and DEXA screening was more likely, excuse me, if you, if you had a DEXA screen, you were more likely to end up on a bone modifying agent, which I think is important. DEXA screening was associated with a decreased risk of major fractures which I think has reflected the fact that they were put on a bone, uh, an agent to stabilize their bone. And the five-year overall survival was better in men who didn't have a fracture than men who did. So for this reason, I think it's really important to treat these men. So this is the, the guidelines. Assess the risk. Uh, go ahead and put everybody on calcium and vitamin D. Recommend smoking cessation, uh, weight-bearing exercises, and bisphosphonate denosumab should be used uh, in patients that have a very advanced uh, disease and are at risk for fracture. Uh, and uh, they should prescribe bone protective agents, as we uh, just outlined, uh, in patients that have metastatic disease to prevent scale-related events. So what about bone-modifying agents not addressed by the AUA? So castrate-sensitive prostate cancer with bone mets. Uh, zolandronic acid was found in a random, randomized clinical trial not to increase the time to scale-related event versus placebo. Two Kaplan-Meier curves that exactly overlap each other. So this is in castrate-sensitive disease before we're talking about castrate-resistant disease. Non-metastatic castrate-resistant disease. Denosumab was found in a randomized clinical trial to decrease bone metastatic free, excuse me, to increase the free rate, uh, but there was no overall survival benefit. There were significant side effects associated with it, so the FDA did not approve this drug in this setting. If they don't improve overall survival, okay, 
uh, is there, uh, what about preventing bone loss? And I think this is something we all should be critically aware of. I know the uh, internists are. Uh, putting patients on, on, on drugs in order to maintain their bone mass so they don't develop a fracture. So the FRAX, all of you should be familiar with this, this is a way of a, a assessing somebody's uh, risk of undergoing a fracture. Uh, the concept of putting people on these uh, drugs earlier in the disease state is increased bone mineral density will lead to a decreased risk of fracture. And these are different doses. This is a different dose of zoledronic acid. Alidronate you can give orally, 70 milligrams weekly. And denosumab also has a, a dose for stabilizing bone in all men that are at risk for fractures. So in conclusion, bone health uh, equals bone loss plus metastases. Patients with castrate-resistant disease should really be encouraged to put on calcium and vitamin D. If there's anything you should take home from this is all these patients should be put on calcium and vitamin D. I think we should argue, there's a good argument that all men over the age of uh, a certain age should be put on it. I know I take it. Uh, you got to be wary of uh, the zoledronic acid and denosumab, that it's going to be cause hypocalcemia and osteonecrosis of the jaw, so be very aware of these side effects. And patients on androgen deprivation should have a baseline DEXA scan, and you should follow them periodically with repeat, repeat DEXAs. Uh, this is something new I put on this year, which is targeting bone with radiation. Uh, this is a STOMP trial. This is a trial that took patients who had uh, asymptomatic castrate-resistant prostate cancer and had metastatic disease on a choline PET. It's a choline PET. It's not a PSMA PET, but that's what they used. And they were managed with surveillance or surgery or, uh, XP, or, or, uh, or stereotactic body radiation therapy to all metastatic disease. In point of fact, almost everybody in the arm that got treatment of the METs got radiation. There were like five people that got surgery. Everybody else got radiation. And the endpoint was ADT-free ADT survival. And what you can see is the patients who were treated to the metastatic deposit stayed off androgen deprivation longer. And all of us know our patients hate being put on androgen deprivation, and hopefully the data I just presented to you showed how bad that is for their bones. The oral trials, trial is a very similar trial. In this trial, they looked, used conventional imaging, uh, and you had to have less than three metastatic disease. So this is not for patients that have metastatic disease all over their body. This is for patients that have metastatic disease in just a few isolated areas. And it was randomized to surveillance versus, again, the, the, the radiation to the, to the metastatic disease. And you can see the patients who were given SABR did better, okay? So radiation therapy helps keep our patients off of hormone therapy and improves their quality of life. In low volume metastatic disease, no impact, though, on overall survival. So all you're doing is keeping them off androgen deprivation a little bit longer. Radiopharmaceuticals. It's really a catch-all of everything in this one. This is also about bone radium-223. So radium-223 is a mimics calcium, uh, and it targets a metastatic disease. It's an alpha emitter, which means that the radiation therapy does not go that far, okay? So it doesn't have a lot of side effects. It induces double-stranded breaks in the cancer cells, and this short duration of radiation actually kills the cancer cells. This is a nice little cartoon. You can see that it's attracted to the area where there's a lot of bone turnover, and, and that's where the tumor is, and it eradicates the tumor. So this is uh, uh, the randomized trial that got it approved. I think it's important to note that these are patients that had confirmed symptomatic, I'm emphasizing that, symptomatic castrate-resistant prostate cancer. They had to have greater than two bone mets. This is not for somebody who has a single bone met. If that was the case, I think I would deliver radiation to that met. So it's patients with multiple mets, known visceral metastases. I think that's important. It's not for patients that had visceral metastases. And what you can see is uh, uh, radium-223 outperformed the standard of care, both in terms of an overall survival endpoint and, and the time to a symptomatic scale-related event. So this is a good drug that's in our armamentarium that we should use in our patients that have symptomatic metastatic disease to the bones. More is not always uh, better. Uh, for the sake of time, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but essentially radium-223 plus uh, uh, a uh, abiraterone was compared to abiraterone alone, and what you'll see is the combination was worse. We tend not to present studies where the, the, the more intense therapy was worse, but I think this is important to recognize. More is not better. It was more likely to have a scale-related event in the patients that got both treatments, a worse progression-free survival, worse overall survival, and more bone fragility. I mean, every endpoint 
favored the patients that got abiraterone alone, okay? Uh, I think this was presented, so I'm not going to really spend a lot of time on this. The vision trial, it essentially so, showed that lutetium uh, uh, works better. Uh, a lot of data that you saw about carbazitaxel and lutetium, these are essentially in the same, uh, in the same group. So uh, it was nice studies that showed that lutetium probably outperforms it in terms of progression-free survival. That's on the left, but on the right, it basically demonstrated there's no difference in outcome in terms of overall survival. So both work in this patient population, uh, and, and it's a little bit of dealer's choice. Again, remember, lut uh, lutetium is only useful in patients that are PSMA positive, whereas carbazitaxel is not dependent on whether someone's PET positive or not. So, bone-directed therapy. SPRT should be used for patients that have less than three METs. I didn't point this out, but non-cranial METs. It's going to increase the time until the patient uh, gets symptomatic or has androgen deprivation, but it's not going to impact on survival. Radium-223 is patients who have a good performance status, symptomatic bone metastases in the castrate-resistant state, no known visceral disease. They can have lymph node positive disease, but not bulky lymph node positive disease. Uh, and then lastly, lutetium can be used in combination with novel androgen deprivation therapy. It can be used for bone, lymph node, and visceral METs. It's not just a bone, a bone agent. Uh, and the PET scan positive patients. Thank you. Why don't we go on to the next one? The next one is a grab bag of stuff, some of which we've also we've looked at, so we won't spend a lot of time on them. I feel like I should get everybody up doing jumping jacks. Okay, so immunotherapy, targeted therapies, and future approaches, right? I'm going to talk a little bit about PARP inhibitors, inhibitors as well. So, uh, CYPT, it's uh, well known to everybody in the audience. Essentially, uh, the patient uh, has uh, anti does an antigen to uh, 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 prostate acid phosphatase. It's infused uh, it's, uh, into cells, uh, into antigen-presenting cells that you've already taken out of the patient's body. Uh, this creates a cell that is actually primed to attack the tumor cell. Uh, these are then fully activated. They're flown back from the, where they were actually created, infused into the patient, and the idea is they're going to sit there and they're going to kill the cancer cells. Uh, it, 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 this involves a patient going somewhere, having the antigen-presenting cells taken out of their body, sent off, uh, and, then, and then brought back and infused into the patient, three treatments. The, uh, it's important in this, the randomized trial that was done, in that it's asymptomatic, or can we go back? Yeah, asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic castrate sensitive or castrate resistant disease. So the key thing here is these are not, this is not for patients that are sick, that have a lot of bone pain. These are for patients who essentially feel great. And, and what you find is the patients actually uh, did well, they lived longer. Unfortunately, uh, there was no D PSA response. And I think that was the primary knock against this, is that the patients and the physician didn't actually feel like the patient was doing better. They lived longer, though. Uh, it, the CYPT was actually probably better than it appears in the randomized trial, because all these patients, uh, not all these patients, the patients in the control arm often got a treatment that was the frozen product that had been saved. It was a crossover design. And if you factor that in, and you say, yes, these patients probably got some benefit, they probably actually, the drug actually worked uh, better. Uh, these are some of the side effects that are associated with them. I would sum it up by saying they have flu-like symptoms. And how do you treat the flu? You know, Tylenol, Motrin, rest, and the patients do pretty well. So uh, this is, uh, in the guidelines, uh, clinicians may offer CYPT to asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic patients. Again, they can't have received prior dose of Taxil. Okay, but it's in patients who have already are, are castrate resistant disease. I put this in because I just think people should be aware, aware of this. Uh, CAR T cells, they get a lot of buzz. Uh, it, it, there's no drugs that are actually available. There's sort of two different types. Uh, the first on the left is uh, the classic CAR T cell, where cells are removed from the body. An antigen is placed in there that will expose these, uh, these prime CAR T cells. In this case, generally responding to a tumor antigen. That's going to be PSMA. That's what they've used over and over again. And then the, the body essentially has a reservoir of T cells that will attack the tumor. 
Uh, I think what's probably going to take off more is the is the bite, which is on the right hand side. This is temporary, but it's essentially a, a, a molecule that's put in there that links the CD3 cells to the tumor antigen. It's not lifelong immunity. You put it in, the body eventually degrades it, uh, and you have to give it again and again and again, but it's a little less complicated to uh, develop. Uh, so as you can see, this is a list of some of the trials that are ongoing. I think the important thing is the, is the uh, column on the far right, which basically says phase one over and over and over again. So I just think this is something you should be aware of. It's working very well in hematologic malignancies and solid tumors doesn't seem to have an effect yet. Uh, this data was presented previously, uh, but it's about DNA repair alterations uh, being discovered in metastatic prostate cancer. Uh, the nice thing about it is all of a sudden we have a target for therapy. Okay? So first of all, we're going to talk about IO, so PEMBRO in MMR deficient cancer. So this is not uh, colon can this is not prostate cancer, this is colon cancer. Okay? But what you can see is the patients who had defects in DNA repair did much better when they were exposed to IO. Okay? So uh, they, a large randomized trial looking at a bunch of different tumors. This is what it got at FDA approved. A single arm trial, this was not a randomized trial, okay? And only six, I believe, it's on here, only six of the patients had prostate cancer, okay? Uh, but in the end, this got it FDA approved. And this is an armamentarium. This is, a, this is a treatment that is not based on disease. It's based on whether you have a defect in DNA repair. Now, I, I like uh, everybody else, a PDL1 inhibitor, okay? Well, why can't we just look at, at, at PDL1? It doesn't seem to work. Okay, so this is a study that was looking at specifically at prostate cancer, castrate resistant prostate cancer. There are PDL1, there are PDA, PDL1 positive, PDL1 negative tumors. This is the actual target. Does the target expressed or not expressed on, on, the, on, the, uh, on, the, uh, on the tumor? And what you can see is there really doesn't appear to be any trend here about whether the patient responds or doesn't respond for PDL1. So the key thing when you're deciding whether you want to use PEMBRO or not, okay, is do they have defects in, in mismatch repair, okay? Doesn't matter what their PDL1 status is or PD1 status. The second uh, way this is being leveraged is through PARP inhibitors. So this just gives you an idea of the molecular basis of this. So normally what happens is our DNA can be repaired in two different ways. Okay? It can be repaired by double single strand break, that's on the right, or it can be re uh, uh, repaired with double strand break, that's on the left. If you give a PARP inhib inhibitor, you can't do single strand break anymore. Okay? Repair. You, you're dependent on the double strand break. Okay? So what happens is, uh, you know, that's the path we use, and if you have a normal cell, your cell can do it. It's got no problem, because it's got redundancy. But if you have a defect in BRCA1, BRCA2, or a host of other genes, you can't repair the DNA that way. So once the DNA is broken, it can't be repaired and the cell dies. So there are a bunch of different studies that have looked at this. So this is a profound trial. It's important this trial used tumor sequencing. Some of the others are going to look at germline. Roughly 400 patients, two cohorts. These were patients that were BRCA1, BRCA2, and ATM uh, deficient. And then there was another, uh, uh, and they looked at overall survival. They had another cohort that had a bunch of DNA repairs, uh, defects, not a single one, okay? And before we go through all these trials, I think the take-home message here as I go through these is BRCA1, BRCA2, clearly the patients appear to do better with PARP, okay, PARP inhibition. Other de defects in DNA repair, uh, or other defects in DNA repair, much less clear, and patients who have no defect in DNA repair, that's where the companies are sort of arguing about it. So anyway, 86 patients, and this actually led to its approval. You can see if you look at all the patients, okay, you saw a benefit, okay? So all these patients had a defect in DNA repair. Uh, they just weren't all in BRCA1 and BRCA2, but it jumps at you how well the patients did that had, had defects in, in BRCA1, BRCA2, and ATM. This is another drug, uh, Recaparib. These are patients who progressed on hormonal therapy and chemotherapy, and they had either germline or tumor defects 270 patients got recaparib, 135 got either docetaxel or novel androgen deprivation. And what you can see is the patients on the top that had BRCA2, uh, BRCA1 mutations, they clearly did better with, with, with recaparib. The patients that had uh, ATM didn't, didn't appear to do so well. This is another trial. This is abiraterone versus abiraterone plus another PARP inhibitor, okay, niraparib. 
Uh, they looked at patients who had metastatic disease, a whole host of different uh, uh, DNA repair defects, uh, and they went ahead and randomized to abiraterone and niraparib versus placebo and abiraterone. And we can see if you look at all DNA repair, you do see a benefit, but clearly the BRCA1 and BRCA2 patients appear to benefit more from the PARP inhibition. Propel is one of the more recent ones that has been published. Again, same study design. Patients that had metastatic castrate-resistant disease, in this case, they'd already received docetaxel, and they were randomized to alaprib versus abiraterone versus placebo versus abiraterone. And I bet, you know, all of you know what the story is going to be here. So on the left, you see the patients that had defects in DNA repair did well. They appear to have lived longer. Uh, uh, this is actually a progression endpoint, not a survival endpoint. But the patients that had no defects in DNA repair, they didn't appear to benefit at all. I think this is the last one I'm going to present. This was presented just at GUASCO. This is using a, a, a very novel uh, 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 PARP inhibitor called telazoprib. I was at trouble pronouncing this. What it does is it actually degrades uh, the, the uh, PARPs. Uh, very similar study design where they looked at uh, uh, the drug plus enzalutamide versus enzalutamide alone, again, in castrate-resistant disease. And what's interesting here, again, these are progression endpoints. On the left, you have uh, patients that were uh, had defects in DNA repair, uh, clearly a, a benefit. But this is one of the first studies where I've seen where there's a benefit in patients that did not have a defect in DNA repair. We're awaiting the survival data. I, I, so I hold off on getting too excited about this until I see the survival data. We've unfortunately seen many too, many, too many studies in which we see a progression endpoint is positive, but then we actually see the survival data, it makes no difference. But it is intriguing. So PARP inhibition, you need to sequence the germline and the tumor uh, DNA in, order to, uh, in patients that have metastatic disease, predominantly castrate-resistant disease. I think uh, PARP appears to work quite well in BRCA1, BRCA2 mutations. Less clear for other, uh, defe other genes uh, that have defects in DNA repair. The drug does matter. These drugs are not all the same. I think, I think uh, you know, the company's going to upset when I say that darlutamide, enzalutamide, and apalutamide are, 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 are the same. They're not. They're similar, though. These drugs are pretty different, and, and it's not clear which one is best yet. Combination therapy may have an impact on patients that do not have uh, defects in DNA repair. So just to finish it up, offer a PARP inhibitor to patients who have deleterious or suspected germline or somatic gene alterations. I would argue that this should really be patients that have BRCA1 and BRCA2. And you should offer Pembro to patients who have mismatch uh, uh, repair deficiencies or microsatellite instability. Uh, I'm going to go through this very quickly. I think we need to start thinking about integrating systemic therapy with surgery. This is actually something I've been working on very hard for the past few years. End-stage disease, these agents all increase life expectancy by two to four months. Metastatic disease, we increase life expectancy by 12 to 24 months. So the question is, can we actually cure people by treating them earlier with these systemic agents? And the good paradigm, this is what we do for breast cancer, colorectal cancer, lung cancer, uh, you know, bladder cancer. I mean, we know this. It works. Uh, so we got to prove whether it works in, in prostate cancer. Uh, this data was shown earlier, so I'm not going to sit on it, but uh, James Eastham and the CLGB did a rather nice trial on this, and unfortunately, the primary endpoint was progression-free survival, did not hit its primary endpoint. Uh, if they'd gone for an overall survival endpoint, everybody would be talking how it's a positive trial. There's a lot of toxicity associated with the docetaxel, so this has not become the standard of care in this country, but in other parts of the world, I think it is. Uh, we've embarked on a whole series of studies where we've taken patients, this is not only at my institution, but also uh, at other institutions throughout the country, where we've gone ahead and taken patients that have high-risk disease, uh, we've give, put them on an agent, uh, and then go ahead and operate on them and demonstrate that we've had a good response. And I'm not going to show you all the data, I'm just going to say that what these studies showed is that intratumoral hormones are, go down are much lower in patients that get more intense therapy, and that uh, there's less cancer in the specimen and it's related to the more intense therapy. In other words, the tumor responds in the prostate to a more aggressive therapy, and the recurrence rates may be better. We don't know that. 
So there's a rather large phase three randomized trial called Proteus that I've been privileged to sort of help run, and that study has completed enrollment over 20, uh, 20, uh, 2,100 patients, uh, and uh, we're going to find out uh, hopefully soon whether it works. Embark to me, uh, which was the trial that was presented earlier today, gives me hope that this trial will be positive and will profoundly change the way we manage patients. And we will have to be giving these therapies as we operate on patients with very high-risk prostate cancer. So in conclusion, CYP-T is the only FDA-approved immunotherapy, so you don't have to think about any others, CAR-T, all that other stuff. The only one that's approved uh, is CYP-T. I should say it's the first one. CAR-T and BITE, I think they're the future, okay? So be aware of them. Uh, PEMBRO for tumors with uh, mismatch repair defects. Uh, PARP for tumors with DNA repair defects, particularly BRCA1 and BRCA2. And I think the future is actually bright, and that we're going to be curing a lot of patients that we couldn't cure in the, in the past, new targets and earlier treatment of the future. So thank you very much. All right, weary crowd, are there any questions for the panel? Appreciate you all coming and your attention and look forward to seeing you next year.